Hey guys, so there are a lot of ways to RV. And in this video, I'm gonna let you know how I've been RVing this summer, keeping costs low, keeping stress-free, and staying cool. Oh my God. Let's talk. And so first of all, hey guys, I'm Anne, single mom, travel lover, and part-time RVer. And this summer I was actually able to solo travel while my son got to visit his dad. So it was me, the dog, in this RV. And this is just how I did RV life this year. And so the first money-saving tip that I use is to not make reservations. Do you hear all the cicadas? So the major benefit of making reservations, you, you can't, can't beat, beat it, is of course to have that camping spot secured. If you don't make reservations and you just show up at a camp spot, especially nowadays, there's a significant chance they're either not gonna have any spots at all or not gonna have the spot that you would prefer to have, which can be a huge disappointment. But there's usually no financial benefit to making the reservation. You don't get like an early bird discount, but you do get a guaranteed spot. And so if you really need to be in a particular spot at a particular time, then making reservations absolutely makes sense. When I met up with Karen and Ginny Springs, we made reservations. Why? Because meeting up with Karen was the important thing. We wanted to make sure and guarantee that we were able to hang out and have fun without worrying about where we're sleeping that night, right? So making reservations, perfect sense in that scenario. But for myself, for my normal style and preference of RV life, I like to go where the wind blows me. I like to go where I feel like going. So making reservations feels like a commitment, meaning I have to stay at a particular place for a particular time. And it's tied with that financial obligation. Like generally you're paying in advance for a spot that you don't even know if you like. And that doesn't make sense to me. I would much rather, and what I did this summer was, I just traveled. I traveled where the weather took me because it was hot this summer. So I always keep moving towards cooler climate. And I just stayed at whatever convenient spot there was without making reservations and honestly without paying for the place to sleep. So it kept me free to move where I want to move, to travel how I want to travel, not being committed. But also it saved me a ton of money not paying for reservations when I kind of didn't need to. Now the flip side of that is this means I slept at Walmart's truck stops and I stayed at a lot more rest stops honestly than I've ever stayed at before. Essentially I just stayed in places where I was allowed to stay for the night. I very rarely stay in the same spot more than one night partially because I'm always moving so I'm just going to a new spot but also out of courtesy. I do think whether it's a Walmart, a truck stop, etc. they don't want you living there and so rotating where you sleep at night just it makes sense. And to be fair, and maybe it's my price range, it could be that. A lot of the places that I've paid for camping, you're just, you're close to a lot of other people. And if I'm gonna be close to a lot of other people, it might as well be a Walmart parking spot. It might as well be a truck stop. It might as well be, like why am I paying that much to be that close to other people when I could stay at Walmart for free? I'm not saying there's no other benefits, to staying at a camping spot and definitely nothing wrong with staying at a camping spot. But when you're on a budget, it's hard for me to justify the two. So this summer, I did not pay to sleep anywhere. My budget, as well as the actual cost of camping for the entire summer is zero. I paid none of that. And I think it really applies when you're traveling to places that you've never been to before, which is kind of what I love about travel. I do think, however, if the style of travel you're doing is to kind of recreate a prior experience, if you want consistent in your travels, it's totally fine to recreate it via staying at very specific locations, which could very well require reservations and also require paying to camp there. Like I said, lots of different ways to RV. But just because I'm sleeping overnight at Walmart or rest stop, which one? The rest stops I stayed at this summer. Let me show you this really pretty place. All right, but look at this. That's Lake Superior. Look how pretty she is. They were scenic rest stops. They were rest stops with just gorgeous views of the lake, of the mountains, just like the rest stops definitely won. But even when I'm staying the night at a Walmart or a Cracker Barrel truck stop, this doesn't mean that I'm living there. Does that make sense? During the day, I'm driving somewhere else. 
Maybe I'm going to a state park or a national site. Whatever sightseeing or activity I wanna do that day, that's what I'm doing. Like I'm basically doing the same activities that I would be doing if I were paying for a campsite. Like I'm, I'm going on the same adventures. I'm just not ending the night at a paid campsite. And because I travel in a van, as opposed to pulling a trailer, etc., you know, when Alex and I stayed at Washington State, there was a private camp spot that we enjoyed going to that I paid for. I think we stayed there a little over a week, not quite two weeks. But in that time period, I didn't stay hooked up and stay in the parking spot because I have a van. I have a, like anything I want to do requires my completely packing up my RV and leaving. It's a little different than if you're pulling your house on a trailer and you can go to a camp spot, park your house there, and then get in the truck and go on your adventures, right? It, it would maybe make sense if you're hauling a trailer to, to make your reservations so that you can keep your house in one spot while you travel, but that's not what I do. I am a class B RVer, so my house is attached to my van, and so if I want to go on an adventure that requires driving, then I'm going to leave my camp spot. And there were times with Alex where we did that. You know, I was at one spot, we're camping, but then I really wanted to do this thing, so I still paid for the camp spot because I wanted to come back, but during the day we left, we had our adventure, and then I got tired. And so the decision was, do I drive? I think we were like two hours away at this point from the camp spot I paid for, or I could just pull into a truck stop and sleep, which is what I did. So it's, it is possible that a lot of my perspective is related to not having a separate vehicle and home because everything is connected in my world. To me, the purpose is adventure. The purpose is going out there and doing the things I want to do. A lot of that requires driving to those locations. So why would I pay to park in one spot? Does that make sense? Now, the second thing that I did to keep costs low is to purposely choose activities that are themselves low cost. Kind of makes sense. I'm not paying for where to sleep, but I've got stuff to do during the day. And whatever those things are, I just choose budget-friendly activities. And if I just want to chill in the RV, which is absolutely what I did most days, I don't want to chill in my RV at a Walmart parking spot. I have done that before, but it's not quite as joyful or peaceful as I would like it to be. So this summer, and just generally speaking, I'm a huge fan of national and state parks. And one of the really amazing things about state and federal campgrounds is they usually have a lot of amenities that an RVer needs. Not only like the bathroom, but showers, visitor centers with Wi-Fi. They often have a place to like dump your gray and black water tanks. They have a place to get portable water. Like they sometimes have laundromats. Now every state park is not the same. So you do have to look up what amenities are available at which park and you kind of have to confirm whether they're okay with non-campers such as myself using some of those features because some locations do have rules where somebody who's not camping needs to pay extra or they might not want you to use those facilities at all. So there is some research and chatting required, but with an annual pass to these locations, it's well worth looking into the amenities that are available so that you can, you know, like, do the things that you've got to do as an RVer. They're usually in really gorgeous places and just calm, chill environments. So even though I'm not paying for camping, I can still go to the parks, relax, enjoy the scenery, go on a hike, swim in the lake, do some RV related errands, and then go on back to Walmart or wherever I'm staying for the night. I just love that the US has all of these parks to enjoy. And so this summer I was predominantly in Illinois, which is where my ex-husband lives. So that's where I dropped off my son. And then because it's summer and super hot, I just kept going further north. So I RV'd in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Now Illinois, state parks are completely free. So I did spend just a few days in Illinois, but at the end of the day, Illinois, you're hot. Uh, hot and boondocking RV life, they don't mix. So I only spent a couple of nights. My favorite place that I hung out was Woodstock, Illinois which turns out is where they recorded the majority of Groundhog Day. A thousand people freezing their butts off waiting to worship a rat. I doubt. You're God. I'm a God. It was not in Pennsylvania. I shouldn't be shocked, but I am. Anyway, that was a super fun visit. But at the end of the day, Illinois was hot, so I kept going north. I spent about a week in different parts of Wisconsin, but as summer kept going, the temperatures kept rising, so ultimately I moved further north. But I would spend my day 
doing the thing that I want to do, whether it's hanging out at Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, also known as Woodstock, Illinois, or whether it's enjoying the 4th of July festivities at Sheboygan, Wisconsin, which was such a fun city right on the coast of Lake Michigan, or hiking and relaxing at the many beautiful state parks we have in this country. I spent the day doing the activities I enjoyed, and the only negative, which saved me 30 to $70 a night, would be to drive to a rest stop, Walmart, truck stop, wherever, and spend the night. That was a great bargain. And it was how I saved a lot of money. Now something I will say, it is my honest opinion that every state in the US has beautiful and fun activities to do, for sure. Like it, it kind of doesn't matter where you go. That being said, aside from the cost of paying for campsites, the other huge cost of RV life is obviously gas right? The gas to get from A to B, there's really no way to fully get rid of that. You're gonna pay for gas if you're living in an RV. But to a certain extent, you can decide how far you will drive. My biggest worry this summer, honestly, was staying in a place that is cool. I really, really prefer highs of 70s and lows in the 50s, even the 40s. That's kind of my perfect temperature. But this summer, most of the US did not fall in that category, which is how I found myself just going further and further north. And I absolutely brought my passport. It occurred to me that I might need to enter Canada just to maintain temperatures. However, everything worked out. I did not have to go that far, but definitely in terms of keeping a low budget, not driving very far ties into that. I currently live here in Georgia. And so just from driving from my house to my ex's house is a solid like 12 hour situation. 12 hours of driving, that's gonna cost gas money. If you're the type of RVer that really wants the spectacular, Instagram worthy, gorgeous scenery, again, you can find that everywhere. But at the same time, the most, I guess we'll say popular places or well-known gorgeous places do tend to be further away from central US, okay? So here's the thing. There are people who every summer, let's say, they must go to Disney World. They live in Montana, but they must go to Florida Disney World every summer because that's what they love doing. Listen, that's great. If you love Disney World or you love a particular theme park or a particular campsite, whatever, if, if you have your favorite place to go, that's cool. But if you are on a budget, you want to stay relatively close to where you live. I live in Georgia. The ex lives in Illinois. The purpose of this summer for my son was to hang out with his dad. Very important to him, totally makes sense. So of course I'm going to Illinois. Now Illinois, just like Georgia, crazy hot. So where am I gonna hang out in my RV? I'm gonna keep moving north. But of the north options, of the places that are cool in the US during the summer, I would argue they're all pretty close to Canada with the exception of maybe high elevation locations. But generally speaking, you're going north. But if you live in Illinois, you don't have to go to Washington State to find cooler weather. You can just go, like I said, I ultimately went to Minnesota and the part of Minnesota I went to was just straight up from Illinois. So if you live in California, I think Washington state makes sense. If you live in Georgia, going to the New England areas might make sense. Did not look at temperatures in New England. If you're in Georgia, driving all the way to Washington state, while you will absolutely find cooler locations, is not necessarily cost effective. My point is I really think a lot of people miss out on the beauty and the activities that are really not that far from home. Because maybe when they Google you know, best places for van life, et cetera, they see Montana and Colorado and you know a lot of west of the Mississippi places. But if you're on the East Coast, going all the way to an epically gorgeous place might not be the most cost effective or relevant thing to do. So would I say that the part of Minnesota I hung out in this summer equaled some of the beauty that can be found in Montana and Washington State? My opinion is probably no. Nevertheless, I still had beautiful scenery that my camera can never fully capture without spending the time and gas to go all the way to Washington State. As a part-time RVer, I just don't have all the time in the world to go literally where I want. And so on a time and financial budget, choosing a beautiful place near your home and near 
can argue that Minnesota is not near Illinois if you want, but my number one priority was maintaining my financial and time budget while finding cooler temperature. And I did that without driving 20 plus hours to get to Washington State. I hope that makes sense. And oh, by the way, when we're talking about keeping costs low in RV life, maintenance is also a huge part of that, right? And so I'm sure it doesn't come as a surprise that the farther you drive, the more remote locations you go to, the more gravelly or like more hazardous the road conditions are in the places that you're going, the higher the risk of getting stuck in the mud, stuck in the sand, the higher risk of shaking your house up and having something break. So in addition to the longer drives, you know, going from Georgia to Washington, in addition to it being costly in terms of gas, and also we're talking about a pretty intensive drive, the risk that something will go wrong in the RV just increases. So if you're able to find a closer destination that can also meet all the wickets, it's probably much more financially beneficial to go to that location. Vice maybe the place Instagram recommended. Like I definitely want to go to Alaska one day, but... So it turns out the road conditions between Haynes Junction and Beaver Creek are terrible. I'm honestly probably never gonna drive there in my RV. Now, do I consider this necessarily sustainable? I'm gonna say no. If I were traveling with my son this summer, I assure you we would have spent more money, not just on things like food, but when you've got multiple people involved, you've got multiple interests that you have to maintain. This summer for me, I just wanted it to be chill, like literally and figuratively. I wanted it to be cooler temperatures. I wanted to relax. I wanted to go on hikes. I wanted to just be surrounded by beauty. And I didn't necessarily need anything exciting. Had I been traveling with my teenage son, he would have wanted a little more activity, a little more excitement, which means I probably would have driven farther, spending more money on gas, as well as spent more money on activities and fun. We probably would have eaten out more. If my laundry were doubled because of my son, that budget would also have doubled. Honestly, it would have tripled because we would probably be choosing activities where our clothes got more dirty and I would need to wash things more. Like just, it is what it is. So having kind of this lower budget is absolutely possible in RV life. But I would say for myself, it's not necessarily sustainable. It's not how I can live all the time, every time. It's just how I can live during a season when it's important to me. But I do also want to add that even though this summer was really inexpensive for me, like honestly, my budget was very similar to the budget I had in Mexico, maybe slightly less, maybe slightly less. But the reality is I wouldn't necessarily call RV life cheap only because just the cost of getting an RV is inherently expensive and the cost of maintaining and repairing and fixing an RV also tends to be on the costly side. But there are definitely seasons, there are definitely ebbs and flows to how much you have to spend. And so this summer I was able to have a really affordable and relaxing summer, not in the heat, which is epic.